It is just a huge honor to be in Phoenix, Arizona on a Saturday night, and these fine people just got done doing the Justin David Moody course. <laughs> Justin, why don't, why don't you introduce everybody? This is your, this is uh, your clan. Why don't you? Uh... This is uh, this is our faculty for uh, the Implant Pathway um, Live Surgical Training we do at the Cast Clinic, or what they call them, the the Brighter Way uh, Foundation now. Brighter Way or Bright Way? Brighter. Way. Brighter Way. Brighter Way Dental. And they serve, uh, you know, they serve the homeless, the the needy, and a lot of uh, uh, U.S. veterans, uh, downtown Phoenix. And and tell them the legal trick of why you can do that here and not have to go to Dominican Republic or Mexico. Sure. Uh, Arizona grants a 14-day Good Samaritan license to anybody with uh, a U.S. license that's in good standing. You can't have ever had it. You can't have ever, ever have had it suspended or uh, any kind of marks on it. They'll uh, Arizona will deny it. But uh, for the most part, I mean, everybody qualifies. And 14 days in two years, you can come and you can't be paid or anything like that. But you do uh, donate. So all 50 states. Uh huh. Even like Louisiana or. Uh, I mean, so they, every, only have, every they only have like half of them in. Only like half of them. Only half of them in. It's good, but uh, this is uh, this is the best faculty in implant dentistry right here. Um, well, let's let's start left 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 right. In introduce uh, your faculty. Uh, right here to my left is uh, Matt Neal. He hails from Belfouche, South Dakota, and he. General dentist, but uh, places a lot of implants and is uh, into full arch reconstructions, uh, single teeth, whatever needs to be done. Uh, amazing clinician and uh, you know total asset to our team. Now you're from Belfast, North Dakota, and you're from Rapids. South Dakota. Come on now. Oh, you're from South Dakota. Yeah. South Dakota. Okay, so you're from Belfast, South Dakota, and you're from Rapid City, South Dakota. Yep. How far How far away is that in a car? Hour. Oh, okay, just an hour away. Yep. Okay, and my grandma Mary was born in Rapid City, so that's romantic to me. And then you have? Jeff Martin. Uh, he comes from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. He is in a, he's in private practice, and his practice is limited to basically implants and removable prosthetics. And uh, he has many years of implant experience and a ton of removable denture, like, like the bread and butter of uh, implant dentistry. And just to be clear, are there extracted teeth in gumbo? No. Is that the only unless, ingredient it's uh, missing? Unless it's from Lafayette <laughs> and uh, somebody, yeah. I thought everything was in gumbo. <laughs> and you, my darling. Juma K. Adendoyan. Uh She is probably the best implantologist in all of Atlanta. And... She also uh, runs, uh, basically, her practice is limited to implants and prosthetics as well, so. And you were born and raised in? Nigeria. And, and uh, Lagos? Lagos. La it's Lagos? Yes. Where my favorite um, dentist of all time was from. Um, his name was uh, Bambi Durogantepe. I think he practices in, uh, uh, somewhere in Florida now, outside of Clearwater, but uh, he was the greatest endodontist I'd ever met in my life, and he was from Lagos, Nigeria, and his wife was, uh, a lawyer named Cammy. They had three kids, uh, Deji Boy, Coco, and Flocka. And one day I was sitting there and I asked him, I said, why are you so smart? And he said something very profound. You know what it was? He said, when you are when you go to dental school in Nigeria, he said, when, when, he says, there's three camps. There's the Americans, the Germans. The Americans affect North America. The Germans affect Europe. And the Japanese affect Asia. He goes, you three camps just drink the Kool-Aid. But in Africa, we were taught differently. We were taught, well, the Americans think this, the Germans think this, and the Japanese think this. So we were never given Kool-Aid. We were given three different main camps, and we had to think. And he said, I think that was the difference. He goes, Americans all drink the Kool-Aid, and we had to pick which Kool-Aid was the best. And he had the most analytical mind I'd ever met in dentistry. We're pretty smart. All, everyone? They're all? A lot. A lot of us are pretty smart. Nice. Yeah. Would you call so, it so brain trust? Nigerian brain trust? <laughs> 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 and where in Atlanta are you? Um, my practice is in Cartersville. I live in Powder Springs, so it's outskirts, suburb mm -hmm. of Atlanta. And there was a dentist on the uh, 
I was scrolling through the channel. This is my favorite show, but it's something like uh, Housewives of Atlanta. And there was a dentist on there from Atlanta. Are you aware of that? I mean, I mean, there was, there's Housewives of Miami. It's married to Madison, right? It's yeah, got, married yeah, to Madison. Yeah, they've got a couple of them. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so do you know her? I know of her. Or yeah. them, yeah. She's not your drinking buddy? No. Okay. <laughs> and who are you? And who are you? I'm uh, Mike Framuth, Wheat Ridge, Colorado. Uh, clinical partner. Uh, He's my good partner. Friend of, good friend of Justin Moody. So you're from Colorado? Colorado. So do you have... License legal marijuana on you right now. Uh, I do not. Ah. I do not. <laughs> That's the only reason no. we invited you. We tried to figure out how to get the vape pen oh on the plane. You know, the, oh the, the feds are a little iffy. Just now. I know, I know. I, know. I, 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 brought, I, I didn't bring anybody in. Well, I'm glad I didn't stop at the store and buy a bong today. I was going to get all ready for it. But. Now, interesting fact. I own his grandfather's practice. His family is all from this little town of Crawford, Nebraska, in northwest, uh, uh, northwest Nebraska. And his uh, grandpa, Doc Frymouth, was um, was our was our hometown dentist. And my childhood dentist and his grandfather were from different ends of the states. And they, Doc Frymouth, wanted to go back towards Lincoln and Omaha because his kids were living there. And my pa old partner, Dr. McWilliams wanted to move back to Crawford, where he was from, so they did a pretty cool thing in dentistry. They, they swapped homes and practices and, and exchanged no money. They hmm. just, uh, they did the switch. Uh, you know, it's pretty interesting, because my dad, um, back in the day, um, in Wichita, Kansas, all of my dad's business dealings were a handshake. Yeah. There was never any paperwork involved. So he's... He's also been my continuing education buddy over the years. You know, last ten well, years. Let me read He says, uh, "Mike Freeman, dentistry is my heritage. My grandfather was a dentist who graduated from dental school in 1936, when Justin was only one. Growing up in a small <laughs> family, I would drive around town with my grandfather and see how he interacted with his patients. They were his friends. That's where it all started for me when I established Pro Smile. My goal is to create a different type of dental practice, one that emphasized patient-centered dentistry. Today, many offices." Practices may have the best technology and use advanced techniques, but without a connection between the patient, doctor, and team, the biggest key to success of ProSmile are my team members. Each is knowledgeable, caring, and patient-centered. They feel everyone is a friend and treat them like a family. My team genuinely cares and is concerned about the person in front of them. We engage with patients and learn what they desire. We can provide the care, experience, and outcome they deserve. My other goal when starting ProSmile was to build an in-house lab. Having a lab in our facility allows us to customize shades for the most pleasing and natural results. Everything is CAD designed, computer assisted, and milled here. Because we do everything in house, I am able to oversee what's being made. Instead of shipping out orders to labs across the country and communicating over the phone and writing, I work directly with the technician here. This ensures a much higher quality of finished product for my patient's smile. My education, I followed my grandfather and older brother into dentistry and attended Creighton University, that's where I went, in Omaha, Nebraska, for my doctorate of dental surgery. Go Jays. Well, while in dental school, I spent three months in the Dominican Republic as a student dentist to provide care to underserved. I strive to maintain at the forefront of advance in dentistry. Today is an exciting time to be practicing because new techniques, materials, and technologies are constantly being developed and impl implemented. Using innovative processes allows me to provide the most proficient, comfortable dental care uh, throughout. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And um, and then, and then of course, <laughs> this is Justin Moody. And uh, Justin... Um, you're with, uh, you own Horizon West Dental and Pro Smiles Dental Lab. Um, you have an amazing podcast. I love your show. <laughs> how, many, how many shows have you put out now? 121, maybe. That, that's cranking, dude. Um, and it's, uh, it's called uh, Bookworms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is, um, and we called it, we shortened it to the worm. The dude's funny, and we thought, hey, you know, you better have some sort of, like, buzzword in your deal so people, when they're searching you on iTunes or whatever, like, they may not remember me, but they're like, oh, what's that one about worms? Like, we're the only one with got worms in it. Well, you know, uh, I love your podcast, love your show. Love um, Fireball? Love Fireball. Um, um, <laughs> love, 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 love it more when I was a little younger. 54 and you're a grandpa, it's a little hard. The, the next mornings are tough. But, you know, um, I always want to remind the young guys, because, you know, the, the human mind, you know, it, it, everything, it doesn't matter if they're talking about religion or politics or dentistry, they have the same kind of mindset. Um, I'm superior to you. I'm better than you, judgmental, weird stuff. But when you read Pierre Fichard, the first dentist in 1800 in France, and you read, that, that's the smartest guy, the guy that started dentistry, and you read his book and you think, wow. Okay, obviously it was a couple hundred years ago. 
Well, I bought G.B. Black, that's the father of American dentistry, which is just a hundred years ago. And I bought these three books, autographed and signed by him, and I sat down and I was just so excited to read The Father of Modern Dentistry. That was the most batshit crazy read I'd ever read. <laughs> Maybe because they, they, they didn't have the germ theory. They were trephinating holes to let out evil spirits. And then they would draw the evil spirits and they looked just like the, the king's court jester guy with the weird hats and the pointy shoes with bells on them. So the toothache was caused by something that's wearing shoes with bells on them. And so then you read, okay, Pierre Fouchard 200 years ago, G.B. Black 100 years ago, and you realize that a hundred years from now and 200 years from now, everything we believe at this table is going to look crazy. And yet right now, dentists will argue till three o'clock in the morning on some little, little deal, but they know what they know, but they have no idea what they don't know. And they have no idea what they're going to figure out a hundred years from now, 200 years. I mean, I mean, but, uh, so I, I want to start with this. Here's how I want to start this discussion. It is June 3rd on a Saturday night, and this week, 6,000 American babies just graduated from dental kindergarten, and they just mm. walked out, and they all have the same complaint. They say, we didn't do, I didn't place one implant. I didn't do one Invisalign case. How does, how, how many implants do you think you, you guys have placed? How many do you think you've placed? <clears throat> the ballpark. I don't know. For me, a couple thousand. Okay. How does she go from, I feel ripped off. I, I, I got $350,000 of debt. I went to four years undergrad, four years of school, and I didn't place one. How do I go from, it's easy for you to go from a couple thousand to a couple thousand one. How does she go from zero to one? That, that's the hardest deal. I followed this guy around. I mean, before he had courses. So you're an, you're, you're an alcoholic then? Finding a course, finding a mentor, that's what this guy does. So before he taught, he kind of got me started. And that's how I started anyway. So, so what you said is you first find something. a mentor. Yeah, you just can't, can't do it from a cold start. You need somewhere to start. So okay, but he you gave me the idea of the places to start. And just went everywhere from there. So. But America is kind of a, um, you know, America, you know, they always talk, you know, truth, liberty, and justice, but they need to scratch that out and just write money is the answer. What's the question? In America, the implant training is pretty much tied to the manufacturer. I mean, they come out of school and they're saying, well, I think I have to push the, pick the system first because every course I see, this one's for Noble BioCare and this one's BioHorizon and this one. So, so they kind of are paralysis by analysis because I don't know who my mentor is until I first pick the system. Is that true or false? Well, I think the majority of your weekend warrior courses are totally driven that way because every manufacturer is trying to, you know, get you to place their implant and push their system and so forth. Uh, you know, one of the things that Mike and I, you know, put together in the implant pathway is, uh, you know, for us to train dentists, like we do have to, we do have to pick a system because we do have to show you some sort of surgical kit. But you know, our, our even though we use BioHorizon implants in our course, like this is not a BioHorizon course. Like this is our continuum of over eighty continuum vacation hours, culminating in the placement of live implants uh, here in Phoenix. Like we, you know, we just got done with three days of clinical training where. We placed 241 implants. In so you guys were the faculty and you placed 241. Yep. And um, will there be any, so how many students was there? 12. So 12 students placed 241? Yes. Will they ever get to see those patients again? They won't, but the next class will. So the, the, the cool part is that we have them about every other month. And as it's, as it's now turned over, we were seeing patients that were, were in the February course. So the implants have had four months of soak, they're ready to go. And the first day that they're there, they get to uncover, take impressions, and we're restoring the last course's implants. So the patients, unlike the Dominican Republic and Mexico and those places where you go down, you fly down, you dump a bunch of screws and you leave, and who knows what happens to the patients. Here, not only do we take care of the patient from start to uh, on site like that. Yeah, you know, they, they actually get the, the dentist here actually gets the training in the process because you think about the weekend warrior course, you can go do all that stuff that you want, but, and you may even go back to your practice and place some implants, but what happens in four months when 
like you didn't have any clinical training of how to do the prosthetic side. So is your is your hands on surgery courses all done in Phoenix? Yeah, that's that's your location, yep. which is an amazing resort town. I mean, and it is. I mean, who wouldn't want to go to Phoenix? I mean, yeah. If you're bored here on a Friday or Saturday night, uh, I mean, you've got the Howard's had, house, but... Uh. I have had a lot of women tell me that it's one thing for a guy to go to Central or South America, but a lot of women dentists tell me they, they feel they'd have to take a, 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 a husband or a bodyguard or someone. They, 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 they how, did, really, how, did, how did you feel, Jennifer? That's the way I felt. You went I to went, the Dominican? I went to the Dominican. Yeah. And you didn't feel safe? No, I didn't. I yeah. didn't like it at all. Yeah, I have a female associate, same thing. She didn't want to go to Guadalajara. Yeah. Yeah, last time I went deep sea fishing in Cabo, um, I mean, oh, I shouldn't say it as bad, but um, the, we were walking back from the uh, fishery to our resort, and it was only like five blocks, and the police called up, and we thought it was a mistake. I mean, we're, here's two grandpas from Phoenix walking back, and they, um, they frisked us, they took our wallet, and they got back to the police car and drove off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've That's never, nice. I mean, I yeah. never knew you could be robbed from the police. <laughs> I thought you'd be robbed from a criminal. I didn't know that criminals drove the police cars. I mean, I, I went back to the uh, deal and I said, I said, was it a fake police car? He goes, oh no, that was the police. So who did you report to? Yeah, you couldn't. You just pay the money and move on. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. But, Chalk um, it up and experience. So, um, so, so you, you, the first key word you said is find a mentor. Yeah. So so let me say, are these are these deals true? Um, Tiger Woods would beat Justin Moody in golf, regardless of what clubs he had. It doesn't really matter the implant so much. I mean, if you know, he's still on his game though. He hasn't like passed out in the car. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lion would never drive drunk, but a tiger would. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 would you? Wow. But, but if you went to these weekend warrior courses, I mean, are you still it kind of drivers that no one ever bought the car that they took drivers ed lessons? I did weekend right? warrior courses too, and like I was looking for something. I didn't. I mean, even though I did the weekend warrior close to courses that I didn't have any surgical skills at all so I referred to Justin and so whenever I sent a patient down there I would tag him on and I yeah so I'd stick the rest of the day with him in his practice and yeah he would show me everything he's doing and finally kind of asked why I was there and he's like do you really want to do this and I said yes and so he Kind of made like an A to Z checklist what I needed to do, and I just followed it. So, but see, do you see what he just said? It's so street smart. When I got to school, most of my, all my hands on CE was the specialist in Phoenix. I would call him up, and half of them thought in fear and scared. They're like, "Well, why would I teach you to do that? You wouldn't refer to me." And it's like, whatever. And then the next guy you called said, "Come on down." And and, and the, so many of these millennials whine about three hundred fifty thousand dollars student loans, but whenever they want to learn one thing, they feel like they gotta fly across the country and go to some institute and drop three or four grand. It's like, dude, you could have learned that at the end of Donna's across street from you. And then, then I go talk to the specialists, they're all introvert geeks, and they're, they want to be a friend. So they're like sending you flowers and cookies and Christmas stuff, trying to get you, you know, so, so you, you, how far away was he from you? 60 miles. So you just drove one hour up the street yep. and never got a DUI. <laughs> that, is, that is just amazing luck. You should have gone to Vegas on all those trips. Um, so I mean that that's just uh and now Justin, your your um, website is drjustinmoody.com or, or implantpathway.com. You can go either place. Okay, so implantpathway.com. So are your those twelve students did they do the didactic on the online and then they come for the hands on or when they come down here do they do didactic and then hands on? So we have four different sessions. The first session is all online. There's 16 one-hour modules that are online. And that online education is the things that you don't need to travel all the way across the country for. You know, physiology, bone physiology, implant rationale, you know, all those, all those things that put you to sleep, you know, you don't have to travel all the way across the country. There's two other sessions that you go to, and we did, we've done them in Phoenix, Orange County, Dallas, we're just finishing up Dallas next weekend. Phoenix, Orange County, Dallas. Denver and San Fran. Denver and San Fran. So that's... So So there's two sessions. So one is online. And session one's online. And that's 16 hours. Yep. Session two is classroom. Yep. And that's two eight-hour days. That's 16 too. Yep. Okay. 
And then three. Same thing. More didactic. Two days. Yep. yep two days. Two days didactic. Okay. And four. Three days of uh, live implant training. And that's here in Phoenix. Mm -hmm. Three times a year. Uh, I'm almost six. I mean. So every other month. Yeah. So the. Uh, Dennis, who's like mom dropped them when they were little, they come during the summer when it's 118. <laughs> Pretty much. And then the ones who graduate in the top half of the class, they come in here in February, I'm, I'm guessing. The warm comes in February. Yeah, I yeah. never understand when Dennis come down here and it's like August. They go, dude, it's hot. I'm like, really? You chose August? Did you never have geography? Did you think we were like north of Canada or... Uh, were you, were, did you confuse Our next over? course is actually in August. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, so. Have you ever been here in August? Well, Atlanta gets pretty warm. Louisiana is warm. Humid. Yeah, but uh, the Colorado boys won't do too well. I'm I, struggling now. It's June. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us your journey. And again, try to speak to the, the yeah. little girl. She's 25, and she feels bummed that she got ripped off and. Paid three hundred fifty thousand dollars. They had a oral I mean, surgery department, yeah, but they never got to you know place an implant with an oral surgery. I guess department. my my journey was a little different. Um, in two thousand, I opened a, a removable only practice. All we do is dentures, extractions, partials. Uh, around oh one is when the mini implants came out, and so I'm like, hey, that's that's a way to help these people because people that are edentulous are typically disproportionately poor. It's just the way it is. Um, I'm like, here's a cost-effective way we can help these people. So for 10 years, I've probably placed, I don't know, a couple, 3,000 mini implants for lower dentures, over dentures. And what brand was that? Um, three, well, it was, it started out as M-Tech. Then 3M bought them. Oklahoma, and then 3M bought them, and 3M's just closed. So now I've got... I, I can't get any, I can't get anyone official from there and tell me why. I mean, it's just like, they stopped. You know, 3M such a big company, though, that, that was just a, a nuisance to them, probably. It didn't fit, maybe, with a division that, that 3M has, and so they said, oh, the heck with it, close it. I mean, they didn't even sell it. They could have sold it. They just closed it. That's just so bizarre. Just one day, they were gone. Yeah. Okay, but anyway. So, so anyway. So you placed about 3,000 MTEX. Oh, yeah. Probably at least. I mean, I've, I've got so many cases over 10 years old with many implants on the lower. Um, it, you know... It worked, but I wanted to, you know, offer different treatment modalities. So probably five or six years ago, started taking courses, a um, bunch of different symposiums, reading a lot of Dental Town. I mean, if you're a young kid out of dental school, that? get on Dental Town. Read the boards. It's there. Just, Justin still hasn't figured out that the internet's not just for porn anymore. <laughs> <laughs> There's other things you can do on the internet. Um, you know, it's it's free, and there's some there's some knowledgeable people. I mean, the, the, there's some cats on there that are sharp. So do yes. that. Take some some uh, symposiums. Do something like what we're doing here. Speaking with of, where's your cat? Where's that damn cat that always walks across the table when you're doing this? <laughs> we uh we were a little low on groceries, so, so we, we ate all our. <laughs> <laughs> So Martin was only he was only coming here because of the cats. We're a pet of cats. We're the cats. <laughs> no. So it, it transitioned from minis to now we're doing you know conventional. We do whatever. I, I still do both. Um, okay, so it's a little bit different. Okay, I, I want to back up a little bit because on <clears throat> on Dental Town we have fifty categories. You know, root canals, fillings, crowns, but only two sections: implants and CAD CAM. On CAD CAM we had to separate. E4D from CERAC. I mean, mm -hmm. Let's eat CERAC are all, you know, they're all, um, I don't know how do you say it, but if anybody posts an E4D case, they had to jump in and say, well, you shouldn't have bought an E4D case. And we're like, dude, that decision was a long time ago. You already bought an E4D. It's on my plan back. It's not like you bought it on eBay. Um, so we had to separate them and yeah. say, you can't, if you're a CERAC person, you can't go on an E4D. Kind of like, kind of like and, a religion thing you were talking about. Oh, I know. Yeah. And, um, I mean, my two older sisters are Catholic nuns. They don't even think Lutherans are going to heaven. Okay, I mean, yeah, they're, uh, but, but the other one was in implants, because anytime anyone posted a mini implant case, all these crazy people had to go in there and say, well, you're, there's no place for mini implants. So why is that so controversial? I mean, a mini implant, by definition, is 3.0 and under, or is it 2.9 and under? 2.9. So, yeah. so, so what is, so if someone places a 2.9, 
to two point eight, they're gonna go to hell, and if it's three point oh <laughs> to three point one, they'll yeah, go to yeah, heaven. It's pretty I mean, close. That, <laughs> You want me to be honest with you what I really think? I really think that when, when MTech came out, they marketed to the general dentist, and it scared a lot of the, the specialists who were the big implant people in their communities, and it scared the hell out of them. And so you just, you know, I mean, they just poor mouthed it to everybody around, but nobody looked at, you know, is it working and is it helping people? Nobody asked that. It was just a pissing contest in the profession. Well, that's crazy. You know, if we're helping people, well, let's help people. You know, let's, let's even help the people that may be a little poor. Not yeah, just you, all on four twenty five thousand dollars dollar but, march. But, but you're, you're not going to find anybody interested in the poor at any dental convention. I mean, like, like take Crown and Bridge. 96 out of 100 crowns that go to the labs are a single unit. Yeah. Then you go to the any dental convention, and they bring in these prosthodontists, and all they talk about is these full-mouth rehabs. And I stand and say, hey, this and is over June. Yeah. There's 300 people in the room. Raise your hand if you haven't done one full mouth rehab in the first half of this year and all the hands go up. So then if you take away that guy and say, hey, I'm going to teach you how to just do two little overdentures for a poor grandma that lives in a barn in Kansas. So like, oh, who, would, who gives a shit about that? You need to do all on four. It's not you even sexy. Yeah. yeah, but but then they'll bring in an all on four, $25,000 an arch, and now yeah. it's sexy. And the bottom line is there's more money in the poor. I mean. Yeah. 14.5% yeah. of America, 13.5% of America goes, lives below the party line. Would you rather own Taco Bell or Roos Chris? Yeah. Would you rather own Southwest Airlines or Rent-A-Jet? I mean, all the money is in the poor. Yeah. But they want to, and, and, then, and, and then Clear Choice um, um, did only 18,000 arches last year in a country with 325 million people. 18,000 isn't even the plus or minus of the accuracy of the population from the Census Bureau. Yeah. It's, it's a rounding error. But minis and overdentures would be huge. Well, in 01, 02, early 2000s, there was, a, there was a huge cost difference. Two standard versus four minis. Four minis was so much cheaper. Um, but now with, with costs coming down with conventional implants, I mean, basically, I can do it for even money. Two, two standard, four minis, it, it, it's the same cost now. Implants have gotten so much more affordable. So, And the two minis, yes, I mean, the, the four minis versus the two conventionals, yes. one of the main differences is that the, the two-piece implant, the conventional root form, you do have more prosthetic options. True. You know, if they want to upgrade, you know, the mini is the mini, and that's what you... You know that's what you got, yeah. And that's kind of a it is what it is. It's a one piece implant. That's that's part of the condition. So you're gonna start a fight in here. We're gonna separate us. All right, I'm going this guy because I can tell you he's a wrestler. Were you a wrestler? He's got a he's got a cauliflower ear. So we're gonna we're gonna team up. I'm going with this guy. All I gotta do is hide behind him, and I'll be good. No, I agree with what he's saying. Now it should mainly switch over to to. Conventional, because like what he says, you're going to retain more bone, probably more treatment options, and the cost is the same now. That, so that there's no benefit, money-wise, for these people, the masses, to go to minis anymore. So, but uh, I agree. We should let Jim McKay talk about how she incorporates both in a lot yeah. of her cases. For, for, first, please, I'm just dying because of am during them. Tell us your journey. How do you, how are you born in Lagos? I mean, I mean, I, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine at 18 years old going to another country. What, what, what was your journey like? And wasn't Sade born in Nigeria? Was who? Sade. Um, no, she was born in England. <laughs> no, she. I think she was Nigerian. She, her father. I think her father is Nigerian. Oh, okay. So she was born. born that's Nigerian. my favorite artist of all time. I love her. Yeah. Yeah. So, everybody says I look just like her. Do you know her job? <laughs> I think the hair. I think she was an Asian. It's the hair. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yes, Nebraska. I was born in Nigeria. My dad was a used so, car salesman, and I have two older brothers who are doctors. One's in Australia, and one's in London. Um, and so I was 18 years old, and my dad decided that he wanted me to have a better education, and so he sent me over here. That's and he sent your brothers to Australia? Well, no, they went later. So I was. So you all came over here? You, you I, I, I actually came by myself. Yeah, my dad was that just me. incredibly frightening? Of course. I was scared. I've never been out of my house. I mean, I... In Nigeria, you, your second language there was probably French, wasn't it? No, English was my first language, actually. It is In my Nigeria? first language. Yes. Okay. We were colonized by the British. Okay, so. so it's a British colony. Yes. Yeah. 
So, so when you're 18, you came to Atlanta? Yes, sir. I did. And then that's I went to college. And then dental school there. And then I went to dental school at Howard in D.C. And which was named after me. That's a, a true <laughs> fact. I'm not even making that up. I am the Howard behind Howard University. I didn't know that, but now well, I now do. do. <laughs> they took down my statue the same day they took Rocky's statue down. Oh. <laughs> they said, we're going to take Rocky and Howard. This there you go. Yeah. So, so, so I your, graduated your in 2001. Okay, when you graduated in 2001, did you place a implant in dental school? I actually did. I placed one. Um, we weren't allowed to place implants, so I snuck into the post-grad um, department, and I was allowed to place one. So, so what would you, what would you tell her who who didn't even get the one? Or let's say she got the one. I know, right? How did she go from one to how many do you think you've placed? Oh my lord! Um, so last year I placed about six hundred fifty in one year. Yes, sir. Unbelievable. So how does she go from I never placed one to placing six hundred and fifty a year? You know, I think it's the same thing. You know, you've got to figure out what it is you want to do. You know, first of all, find out if implantology is what you want. And then attach yourself to a mentor. Find them. Hunt them down. Like I did him. Which is interesting because because she's thinking, I got to pick the implant. I got to pick the system. I got to pick the institute. And you guys are all saying, no, find a mentor. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, a screw is a screw is a screw. You know, I mean, they're different in... You know, they market it differently, but... She'll like how that sounds later. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to find a guy to do that. I... <laughs> pretty much a screws and screws. They all do. But, uh, but so I, right. you know, so... But, so you, and how did, and who's your implant mentor? Who's your first implant mentor? Um, <laughs> Justin Moody. And how did you in Atlanta find Justin in South Dakota? Were you at the post office? You saw the 10 most wanted? <laughs> you said, damn, one of the no, places in Atlanta. You know, something like that. Like we said, I had gone to Dominican Republic, and I had gone for one of these trainings, and I just didn't like the way it was done. You know, it was very roguish, and I didn't get everything that I thought I was going to get. And I somehow came across this guy, and I went to some of his courses, and I think my vision for what I wanted in practice, just aligned with what he was offering, and that was it. And in, the, in, in your journey, did you ever have a mini implant um, component? Or? Oh yes, um, I started, so 2004, I started placing mini implants. So I have placed probably a thousand or so. Was that in tech also? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And now I still place darn gold implants. You know, they, the, yeah, they someone, have Yeah, someone said that in tech turned the, the what, are the, what is it, the, what, 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 are, what are the patents called, 405Cs or four, whatever? 503 or 503. So, some, somebody told me, I can't get any confirmation for him, but somebody told me that the, their 503s or whatever were sold to Stern Gold. Is, have you ever heard anything like that? I don't even know what 503s are. Well, the, 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 the legal, the, the intellectual property behind the I interest. don't know. Yeah. I have no clue. 510K. Yeah, cool. yeah so, so it's I, the, I, the FDA's clearance for okay. the, uh, uh, a particular have, design. Have, have you heard that the M Tech designs went to Stern Gold? I don't know. I, this I don't weekend know what they said no. Yeah, Stern Gold, the Stern Stern Gold was there this weekend. We we placed some minis this weekend, and um, talking with the guy, we we talked had the same conversation, and he said no. They yeah. they they had gotten word that that 3M was going to probably stop, and so they kind of got in front of it and was ready to, so, to release it. So um. You're, are, you, are you doing any minis now? Or are they oh, all? yes. I, I place a lot of minis now. And what I do is actually combine both the root forms and the minis. So when the root form implants are placed, and while we're waiting for the in, osteointegration, I place mini implants in between it and retrofit those dentures right away. So the patient has some sort of stabilization from the beginning. Nice. And we call it the anodoin hybrid. The what? The anodoin hybrid. Well, that is so nice because... Yeah. Because dentists always forget, at the end of the day, that mouth is attached to a human, and nobody ever got their teeth fixed for um, anything other than mental health. They wanted their teeth for self-esteem, smile, talking, um, when they lose their teeth, I mean, they, they're mentally traumatized. I mean, um, dental health, it's just something you do to get people to mental health, and I imagine being able to walk out with something in their mouth that's fixed is just a beautiful thing. Oh yes, it is, absolutely. The patients are happier, you know. I mean, when you're placing those implants and they have to spend another four to six months with a denture that still moves around, especially in the mandible, 
um, as opposed to having those minis in there, having it attached, and they can actually eat and function. But you know, a lot of the young kids, um, I think a lot of the young kids... And that's kind of what we did um, right there. And purple is my favorite color. <laughs> Prince, was this all off the cover of a Prince album? I mean, it is. Oh, it looks like it. It is purple. Um, but you know, one of the things little kids get in trouble too, and then 25 years old is, um, um, most of the times they get in trouble, they, they heard the birdie on their shoulder. The patient talked them out of doing what they wanted to do. Like the, the young dentist, 25 to 35, I'd say 25 to 30 at least, almost every time they get in trouble is they say, well, I need to send you to an oral surgeon. No, you pull it. Or uh, we need to bury this implant, let it heal four months. No, I want you to immediate load it. I, I want the tooth on my they're The young patient, um, the young dentist is the tail and the patient's a dog. Yeah. And then by the time you're 54 years old, you're the freaking dog. The patient's a little tail. And, and, it's, and you just don't blink at firing your patient. Well, that's not how we do it here. You know, there's 3,800 dentists in Phoenix. I'm sure you can find someone to do that, but you're not going to have it done here. Um, what do you think? Do, do you think the market is creating too much noise about immediate load? I mean, you're yeah. talking about, you're talking about, yeah. you know, that you're stabilizing these. Yes, I, I think so. So when patients come to you and you eventually the mandible, um, and then you immediate load, and then you tell the patients, you know, it's immediate load, but don't eat anything too hard. The reason why the patients were being edentulated most of the time is because they were not compliant with taking care of their teeth a lot of times. And now you're putting this expensive thing in there and you expect them to be compliant. Now they've got a full set of teeth. So I normally just don't want to put the fate of my implants in the hands of my patients. So I'd rather keep those buried and give them these two minis to function on. Which is why when you talk to orthodontists, only 20% of their cases are Invisalign. Because when you got some 12 year old boy there who's worn the same University of Nebraska shirt for four days in a row, he hasn't combed his hair, he's got a burger hanging out of his nose, <laughs> but he's really going to be compliant on those trays. Yeah. I mean, you, you can see that kid a block away and say, no, we're gluing the brackets on him, taking every variable out of him. And, um, but, yeah, but yeah, and, and you know, that's another thing they get confused on. Because in school, when, you know, those who can do and those who can't teach, and they're reading all this ivory tower stuff. Well, you don't put implants in smokers, and you don't put them in if, if they're drinkers or drunks or on drugs or that. Well, those are all the, in, in, in Phoenix, <laughs> you know, the yoga instructors aren't the one losing all their teeth. You know, they usually come in and say, is there a piece of tofu stuck in with you? <laughs> the people that come in, they're losing all their teeth. They, they, they live in a trailer smoking meth, smoke pack a day. Yeah. You know, they, when they come in, they say, will you hold my beer? Well, I take yeah. my, you know. So, so what would you say, what, what, is, what, do you, what do you say about the health history? Because it seems like the people that, exactly, the, the ones that need the most treatment probably aren't flossing the most. Of course. And so you... So she, she agree with me, so I'm not an ass. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the quote was, of course. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you for validating remember. my answer. Yeah. I can't remember what I was going to say now. Oh, but, but no, the, the, the health history, the, the ivory tower people said that you can't put them in smokers, you can't put them in, in uh, drinkers and smokers and druggies and all that, and then, and then out here... The, the, the joke of Phoenix is it's Apache Junction because any police officer will tell you the big joke in Phoenix is that the fire department finds more meth labs than the police because meth labs always go up in flames and every time every time a trailer goes up in flames and it's a meth lab it's always an Apache Junction so the big joke around here is uh, that you have to drive clear to Apache Junction to get your meth but they um and every police officer I've ever met in my life says that every trailer park in Apache Junction has a meth lab. I mean, it's like yeah, yeah. But those are a lot of people that lose all their teeth. Yeah. Um, people who smoke, I mean, pack or two a day. People who come home every night and drink a twelve pack. Those are our patients. So what would you tell a twenty five year old who just walked out of school, and they said, well, those are the ones you can't treat. Well, if you disqualify the smoker and the diabetic patient. Um, who's under control and the drinker, then we don't have enough patients to place implants on. But I think if you if you think about those risk factors, I mean, if you if you go back to you know what John Coyce talks about is uh, you know assessing our patients' risk, and smoking alone, it's a minor risk. Like you can you can do you can alter your procedures to deal with that. But what about 
the smoker that's also an uncontrolled diabetic. Now, when you start to stack those treat those risk factors on top of each other, now you're starting to get now your needle is starting to go from yellow to red, you know. And then you know what about the smoking diabetic bisphosphonate user? Like that's the one you probably like. Sometimes no treatment's the best treatment, and sometimes yeah, that's the deal, you know. And math. And math. <laughs> so, so to the young graduate, you want to start out with maybe the patients with no complications and leave the patients that have those stacked up risks to maybe someone that is more um, experienced. I, I want to ask another question. Um, sorry, we're, we're, no, we're, we're, we're all trying to keep you out of the conversation. I'm good with that. We're all trying. <laughs> you know, um, the, the, the other thing she, the other thing she's, my job is to guesstimate um, what they're thinking as they're committing to work. And what they, you know, they, dentists are paralysis by analysis. They overthink everything. And they're thinking, well, should my baby step, my first step, should it be to replace a single for a molar? Or should I be two implants for removal? What would be the, the lower skill set? What would be the better first move? Two implants and an overdenture or one implant and a fixed single crown on Two implants and an overdenture. That would be that would be dental kindergarten yes. first journey? Yes, sir. And explain your thoughts why. Um, so when you're dealing with natural dentition, they've got to think about the existing teeth if they're replacing a single tooth, as opposed to when you're just, it's an edentulous mandible, so you're building up teeth. You know, there's nothing there. It's a blank canvas, as opposed to when you have teeth adjacent to it. You've got to place that implant so that when you restore it, everything looks in sync. So it's a lot more you've got to think about. We're going to let you talk now. I'm good. What, 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 what would your, what, if she said, I just want to take a baby step. I, I can't place a thousand a year, but I've right. never placed one. What would be your first baby step? Uh, you know, the mentorship I agree with starting out, but I, but I also think, uh, you know, friends and colleagues, you know, joining up with somebody for Justin and I, and, you know, I would ask, I mean, Justin would, would say the same, uh, you know, getting a partner out there, going through the educational process together, sharing the experience. I mean, you know, you're not getting on dental town and sharing all your negative occurrences and, you know, all the crap that happens during your day and, and all those, those things that just eat at you, but you have a friend and colleague that you're sharing similar time and experiences. Um, that for me, uh, that was more invaluable, I think, than even mentorship. Because um, every night you're on the phone, I was like, oh, I had this, I had that. He's like, I had this, I had that. Uh, not only are you sharing, you're also learning what others are doing just through their experience as well. Uh, we had a great opportunity to teach uh, a group from Kentucky who have their podcast as well. Uh, Ten doctors just coming out of school. Um, collectively, they're like going on a journey together as a unit to learn all of these things. Um, there's a lot of power in that. Um, and just from my experience sharing it with Justin, and I was doing it with Justin, so uh, it, it worked out okay. Um, you know, L.D. Peggy was from Kentucky. Did you know that? Did not. Did not. And, and his message really got polluted. I mean, when I started, when I got out of school in uh, 87, 30 years ago, I knew lots of older people that actually knew him. And he was actually from Kentucky, and where his story, I think, got distorted. And now um, Leanne Brady from Phoenix, she's going to the Pink Institute. Maybe she can restore the historical uh, um, reality. But he was from Kentucky, and if you came in and you were poor, you saw associate number one, who was straight out of school. And if you had a little bit more, you know, maybe not a single crown, but a bridge, you went to associate number two, who maybe had four, five, six years. And if you needed a lot of do it, it was associate number three. But if you needed the complete flip and rehab, it was L.D. Panky. And then he eventually moved down to Florida um, when he, you know, he got more money and retired down there. But everybody always associates Panky with L.D. Panky behind door number four. It's like, dude, that dude was from Kentucky. Kentucky. And then that's what I tell my European people. They say, you know, what is the problem with Greece? Do you not realize that since this country was a nation, um, Kentucky has run at a deficit? And Connecticut and California have run out of tax surplus. And I, I told the Germans, I said, you just, you just got to pay it. I mean, we, we've been funding Kentucky the whole damn time. And L.D. Pankey, the sacred dentist of dentistry, I mean, he's one of the greatest ever. Mm -hmm. He treated the poor and he made money treating the poor. So he had, this, he had the Taco Bell, he had the sit-down Mexican restaurant, and he had the five-star dining. 
But now everybody talks about just the five-star dining rehab. They don't talk about the fact that, you know, he would have money. And I want to tell you another business model that, you know who, which implantologists I know who have made the most money watching this? Because I got my fellowship of the missions to 30 years ago, I don't know, 25 years ago. I think it was, it was in the 90s. Um, I think I even had hair at the time. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I might have. Um, <laughs> and then I got my diplomat in the International Congress from Pantology. That was when it was a two-dimensional panda. There was no, you know, um, um, Dennis and Amcon beams. Um, but um, those dentists would go through and get their diplomat in the International Congress from Pantology. Then they would go back to some place like Kentucky or South Carolina, some poor area where there had been some denture world there. That was doing like three or four or five hundred thousand a year for like twenty years, and everybody in this big area went to Denture World, and they had the, you know, the full mouth dentures for two ninety five, and then they had a little bit nicer. They had like the maybe the four ninety five, and the deluxe was like six ninety five, and they went in there and said, yeah, yeah, six ninety five, or two implants, twelve ninety five, four implants, this. Or, you know, all on six, upper and lower, 20000 And these guys would go in and buy these $500,000 denture worlds with 20, 30-year brand names and ramp them up to 3 or $4 million a year. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, it's, it's absolutely the biggest business model, but so many dentists, like when they come out of school here, they go, well, I got a lot of student loans. I think I better go to Scottsdale or Beverly Hills, Being or elitist. Cuba Scudding, because I need to go where all the money is. Like, really? You you don't want to own Southwest Airlines? You don't yeah. want to, you, you'd rather own Rent-A-Jet? You don't want to own Ikea? You'd rather own some fancy furniture store? I mean, the money is all in the poor. I mean, would you rather own Roos Chris or Taco Bell or McDonald's? McDonald's. Would you rather own Southwest Airlines or Rent-A-Jet? Well, I might want to fly around a gym, but definitely want to own <laughs> Southwest I Airlines. Mean, no. Again, so you said you start off and get a mentor. You started off, go with a friend. Right. And obviously someone's running personality because your, your friend ended up being Justin. It, so, it is an issue. So, so, so you couldn't find a friend. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't know, I, oddly enough, our mentor put us together because uh, oh, really, really? he really yeah, we did. Had the same mentor. Who was the mentor? Roger Plooster from Lincoln. He's also from my hometown of Crawford, Nebraska. And he put you two together. Yeah. He put us together. He was and good he, friends with Carl Mish. Really good yeah. friends with Carl. Was it his so. first class that they did in his uh, office and back you, in the and, day? And you guys use BioHorizon. We do. And that was, um, Carl Mish was instrumental in that company's beginnings, wasn't yeah. he? Carl Mish, uh, Martha Badez, uh, Todd Strong, and eventually Steve Bogan all put that together. And, uh, and mobile, where in Alabama? Birmingham. Birmingham. And that's where they make the uh, solid rocket um, of, the, uh, of the, what? That's Huntsville. Hunts, oh, Huntsville. Northern Alabama. Man, no, Alabama is very, very high tech, and that's where BioHorizon is. Birmingham's got a lot of technology in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, uh, yeah, it's amazing. So why, why did you go with BioRite? I suppose there was some sway that way. You know, I was, uh, when I got out, you know, when I got out, I knew instantly when I went back to my, you know, hometown that was heavy and removable, you know, dentures, you know, out in western Nebraska, you know, and I was like, I can't, I can't adjust dentures all my life. Like, this, is, this isn't going to work. So I went to Denver, and I took a weekend warrior course, a 3i course, and... It was great. The first time I'd ever spent, you know, a couple thousand dollars for CE, like, like, oh shit, like, can I really afford this? Uh, <laughs> but at the end of the pitch, you know, at the end of the weekend, like, I got the hardcore pitch to buy, you know, a twenty thousand dollar surgical kit and motor and that, and I was like, now that I can't afford. So I went back home and I was like, ah, oh, dang, you know, what am I gonna do? And you know, the the interweb was just kind of getting rolling, you know, back in the <laughs> late 90s. So uh, uh, so I found, uh, actually I found Sturmgold, uh, which was, the implant was just machine smooth. There was no surface treatment. There were external hexed. But how they got me was uh, they did a consignment plan. Once a month, I would have to fax them a sheet of what I used, and they replaced them, and they billed me for it. And I didn't have to pay for this big inventory. You know, and my, my partner, my partner said, he goes, I got a buddy that went and did a Corvent course years ago out there. And he goes, I think he still got the motor in a box. So Howard sent me the motor. So I got, I got a motor for free from Howard and I, I, I did a consignment from Sterngold and then uh, Culzer bought Sterngold and then Zimmer bought Culzer. And so I ended up in 
Zimmer tapered screw vents. And eventually our mentor said, hey, you know what? You're doing good, you're placing these implants, but uh, you, need to go some, you need to get some real education. So we went, uh, we partnered up, we went to uh, Mish, you know, we did all his courses, became, you know, actually him and I and another guy were the first masters that got their mastership at the Mish Institute. And then we went on to the AID Maxi course and stuff. But to get back to your question, there probably was some sway to Bio Horizons. And, you know, Jim has already said that a screw is a screw is a screw. Uh, that's a quote from her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we can assume that they all work. Then why would you pick one? I mean, why would you pick one over the other? Price? I mean, is it all about price? You know, because if it's just about price. Well, in, in, in a litigious country like America, I'd want a company that could, that could show some R&D. So, I mean, I can buy an implant from Russia or wherever if I practice in 200 countries. But if I was in the United States and the implant failed, knowing the way the legal system works... Right. Why um, did you put the $29 screw in? You yeah, know? yeah. And, and, where, and where's our, where the research on this? Right. And I think what... So just a brand name. A brand name that a company could sell. Right, but, but to your point, why do we have this big separation in brand names? You know... You, uh, I think, you know, I don't know if those three eyes, mo number one or Strauman, you know, you got Nobel, Zimmer, and Bio, but and Bio's number five, and you got those five uh, in that deal. What were those five again, Sam Sorry, Noble? Strauman. 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 Uh, Nobel's uh, Sweden. Nobel. And yeah, now Strauman's. it's all owned by Danaher now, so Implant Direct and Nobel are made owned by the same company. But Strauman's uh, Switzerland? I think so. And then what was the other one you said? Uh, uh, Zimmer. Zimmer. You know, it used to be Zimmer and 3i, now they're one and the same. And then you got Bio Horizons. All right, that's only four. You said another one in there. Uh, I think well, I think I separated Zimmer and 3i. But, uh, and Strawman, uh, oh, Megagen. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they're, they're coming up. And, you know, so when, if you look at there, why are those implants not cheap? You just said it, because it's R&D. Like, there, there are things about brand names that give you that. And for me, what swayed me to Bio Horizons is... There is science, so if it's if there is a difference in the subsets, you know, like if there's something that one implant does better in certain aspects or in uh, the 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 maybe sketchy placement, you know, like an immediate implant that has a little higher failure rate. Like I want science behind me, and for Bio Horizons, I like uh, the laser lock. I like the laser lock technology, and I also like uh, the platform shifting. So for me. There is, a, there is a difference when you get into the premium line implants. That's why I chose Bio Horizons. So this is Dentistry Uncensored, um, so no um, dancing around it. What does this phase one, two, three, four cost? 17,000. 17,000 and? 12,000 of it is, is session four alone. Okay, so session one is how much? Well, you, you, either, you get to either take the first three or you take uh, all four. So you, you can't buy just such one or two or three. You gotta so you gotta buy the three? Yep. And how much is the three? Uh sixty nine ninety five. Yeah, sixty nine ninety five. Sixty nine ninety five. Yep. And why do you go sixty nine ninety five instead of seven thousand? Five bucks sways people. No, no, I I'm, I'm trying to fight this. It's a, it's it's <laughs> urban myth. Everybody thinks that everyone went with ninety nine cents because it sounds cheaper than a dollar. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't. It was um internal control over embezzlement. So when you would um, charge 99 cents for everything, everyone, you know, and we're talking about 1800s. When you charge 99 cents, they give you a dollar and I'd have to give you change for a penny. So when you open up the cash register, you bust open our old pennies and you dump your 50 pennies. So they go at the end of the day, you count your pennies, you have the number of transactions. So these are all measurements for accounting. So everything was 99 cents because you started with 50 pennies and then you count transactions. But the, but there's been so many studies on a PhD, um, double doctor, PhD, economist, psychologist, you know, there, there's, uh, but it's, uh, but seven, so it's seven, seven thousand, grand. seven grand for the first three. You'll be changing. And then it's 10 grand. <laughs> I don't know, it's seven <laughs> grand. <laughs> Website would be long And then it's 10 grand for the three day course. And by the way, you, you said two other economic lessons I want to go over with you. You said, here, here's a, a boy in a rich country who goes to dental school and they uh, he didn't have the money for the starter kit. What did you say the starter kit they were trying to it's sell? It's like you? 20 grand. Yeah, 20 grand. 
And I'm a hundred percent Irish at two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, had the whole family tree worked out. They all came out here in eighteen fifty. But what was the greatest sewing machine ever made? What's the most Singer. Singer. And when Singer came out and when Ford came out, I mean, when Singer came out, there were like over 80 different sewing machines and all the jobs were textiles, but everybody wanted their 50 bucks for the sewing machine. And old man Singer saw a million Irish wash up on the shore and all the jobs were textiles. He couldn't get a job without a, wa a sewing machine. So he was the first guy to offer installment credit. And he went to all the Irish said, I'll give you the sewing machine every Friday when you get your three bucks, you come back and give Singer a dollar and you're gonna do that every week for a year. and and. So all the other sewing machines were bankrupt. Everyone will tell you that Henry Ford, uh, some will say Henry Ford invented the car. Well, he didn't. That was invented in Europe, a little thing you never heard of before, Mercedes Benz. Uh, but he invented the assembly line and he sold 10 million cars. But no one ever knows the story why he stopped because GM, General Motors started and they started GMAC financing and old man Ford, you had to give him 668 or you wouldn't get your, if you had 667, you didn't get a car. And GM said, you know what? We're gonna do installment credit. And Ford had to close his damn Model T plant down. They closed that plant down because of installment credit. And when you're selling implant cases, this is America. In America, if it costs over $1,000, 90% of the time, it's finance. Only 10% of Americans buy their cars in cash and their houses in cash and those are the idiots who get the senior citizen discount. Yeah. 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 You wouldn't give them a discount if they were married, three kids, and working three jobs at the Waffle House. Yeah, give the retired lady who just bought a house and car in cash. When they ask me for a senior citizen discount, I say, I'm already paying for your Social Security. <laughs> now you want me to pay your Social Security, your Medicare, and give you a discount? How about a big hell no? And, uh, so, um... So the bottom line is when you present these cases to dentists, you need installment credit. So when you're when you're doing cases, what percent of your implant cases come with some type of financing? Oh, over 50% of them. Yeah. For sure. Nobody can afford that kind of treatment. But like we talk about all the time, maybe a brother can, you know, maybe a rich uncle can or grandma just died. I mean, it, those are the things that it comes down to. I mean, it's always comes down to price. You know, they all Care want they, they all want the treatment. Or even uh you know what it comes down to? Well, well it, it doesn't come down to price. It comes down to terms. Donald Trump right. taught me that. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to get into sex or religion. No, I don't know. I'm not like, but, but back in college. <laughs> no, when I was in college, I read that Art of the Deal, and it had one burning impact. Donald Trump taught me one thing. He said, it, it never comes down to price. It's always terms. He said, I'd buy your house for a billion dollars. If the terms were a dollar a month for a billion months, because I'll turn around and make a damn house out for a thousand a month, so I'll make nine hundred ninety-nine a month for a bill. So it's never the price, ninety percent of the time. It's the terms, and so many people walk in there and say, "Well, to do this, it's going to be seventeen thousand dollars." Other people walk in there and say, um, "You know, they on their on their chart and said asking them, have you ever had herpes, gonorrhea, syphilis, chlamydia?" They start saying the finance question: Have you had the same? How long have you had your current job?" What is your home address? And they, they run a credit check and they walk in there and say, my God, congratulations. We can do everything the doctor wants to do for just $349 a month for 60 months. And the only thing they heard, it's three, four, nine. Just like your employees, they never know their gross paycheck. They never know the fine, the, all they know is their net. They never know any other number. And when you walk in and say, we can do the whole thing for just 350 a month, for 48 months, they're like, oh my God, I got 350 a month. So it's never the price for 90%, it's just the terms. That's why anybody, anybody that contacts us and needs better terms, we'll work with them every time. Because, you know, for the new grads, that's expensive. We even give it a new grad discount. Well, let's look at the return on investment. So if, you, um, if you're gonna charge 7,000, you're gonna to have to just place seven implants. I mean, it's, it's like when people get tripped up on the Invisalign course. Like, dude, I'm pretty sure one case, I'm pretty sure one one ortho case, I mean, the average ortho case, $6,500. You couldn't find an Invisalign course that costs that much if you had to fly to Switzerland. Um, you know, so, so basically, um, that course is seven implants, so the whole thing is 17 grand. So then the question comes down to, 
um, what is the your track record that someday, uh, what percent of your graduates will place 17 implants after your training? Uh, it's batting over 80% right now. I mean, you're always going to have some people that, you know, even though you come here and you place implants in, you know, in the live surgical, there's always going to be some people that, uh, at some point you have to go back to your practice, you gotta pick up the scalpel, look at the tissue, pick up the scalpel, look at the tissue, and some people just, that's not for them, you know? But the fact is that- uh, That's where the uh, lab training comes in. Yeah. The fact is, is that we're there. I mean, you know, Mish's was, I think, you know, pretty low. Yeah, but it was, it was also 100 Yeah, but it was also 150 people at a time, you mm. know. Our classes are much smaller. So, so you just said something, you just opened up a huge can of worms. You, you like the, the worms thing. Um, probably one of the most controversial things in implantology is um, a surgical guide or not. Um, it seems like no. it seems no. like if you um, find any <clears throat> red-blooded American who's placed over five thousand implants, they've never used a surgical guide. And then you find any kid that's a millennial, and they're like, "Well, I want to, I want to use a surgical guide." And then the old guys are telling them, and "I've seen it at study meetings, I've seen it at lectures. I mean, I see it on Dental Down." The old guys like, "Dude, do you still have training wheels on your bike? I mean, you got a second bike cuspid, a second molar." I believe you need to be a surgeon. I'm pretty damn sure you need to lay a flap. I mean, you, you blah. But it's very opposing camps. Very opposing camps. So where do you guys fit in that realm? You know, I think that there's a place, you know, there's a place for both. And there's a place for guided surgery when it's properly uh, put together. It, for example. Well, first I want to know, validate what I said. Is what I said true? That all the guys that were 50 who have placed five to 10,000 implants? Rarely, pretty much rarely a guide. Rarely ever rarely a guide. Rarely a guide. And what percent would you say never used a guide? Well, probably up, probably upwards of 70% of them. Yeah, okay. So I just want to yeah. make sure that that's yeah, the right. same. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same numbers. But yeah. just like uh, today, we placed, uh, we did two edentulous guides. So they were tissue born, they were already edentulated, but they were, the case was set up in a way where the patient comes in with uh, terminal dentition, you know, pus and blood and you know, you know, all the, all the nasty bugs that you don't want to drop a bunch of screws into. So uh, the patient was edentulated, uh, the alveoloplasty was done uh, to make a nice base, the extraction sites were grafted, it was left uh, for about four months to heal, the tissue to heal, then the surgical guides were made. And from that point, when the surgical guides go in and they're pinned together, A, the, the implants go in in exact positions. It's very quick. Um, and the end result is very good. But it has to be set up that way, you know, to, you know, for in my opinion, it has to be set up that way to be, you know, in full arch. Versus you see a lot of people out there talking about, oh, you know, we're going to make bone reduction guides and we're going to, you know, snap these on and then we're going to immediately load them and things. And the truth of the matter is, is that there's a, there's a smaller, there's a smaller set of population that, of dentists that can truly do that at a high level to have those kind of success stories. And when you add those technologies on top of each, yes, they exist, but they also add a level of complexity that experience sometimes doesn't have. You know, I mean, you're asking someone with less experience to do something that is really a very complicated thing. When in fact, it's not that it's not that difficult to take the teeth out, lay a flap, most and bone down, and, and 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 do it the right way. But you can do it either way. But the only secret to lower price is lower cost. So when you add start adding steps and guides, you're going to add cost. You also, you know, there'll be those that would say, okay, now it used to be the guides got a bad name because you know, and and the part of this is true is that. They weren't same day. Like someone walks in, someone walks into my office and says, hey, you know what, my teeth are done. I need to do some implants. And you'd say, okay, that's great. I'm gonna take some pictures. I'm gonna take uh, an impression. Week, two weeks later, I'll have your guide ready and I'll do it. Well, you know, that person came in because they finally got over the phobia hump that I need to go to the dentist. And they knew that it's gonna be expensive. It's gonna be two weeks. And now they're like, well, life happens, you know, tranny dropped out of my car, kid went to college, you know, whatever it is. So now this money, two weeks later, a month later is gone. 
and that case never gets going, but yet you've got a $400 guide sitting in the shelf because the patient never came back. Today, you, you hear plenty of people, you know, Corey Glenn and those guys are you know, awesome. They're like, oh, you know, just print it, just print it in your own office, you know, put the printer here, you know, you do all this stuff. Well, it's kind of like the CEREC, like, how much time does it take you to, uh, how much time does it take you to mess with that thing? Because the implant's only got a set price, and it's your time. And you're selling your time in small blocks, and you get this for the implant, but yet I spend an extra 30 minutes planning it, you know, and stuff. Like, that's, that's, that's going against the price of the implant. Now, you went to Creighton. I did. And where'd you go? Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Um, how many times did you apply to Creighton before you finally just gave up? <laughs> <laughs> um, Creighton was home Omaha, uh, Warren Buffett. He came in and talked to her business class in, in 1980. And he's, Warren is 90 years old now, and he still says all the time, we're talking about the elite S&P 500. He says 95% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 still spend 95% of their time trying to make everything more complicated and expensive. He said in his 90 years of watching human behavior, only 5% think the only secret to lower price, lower cost. How can we do this faster, cheaper, easier? 95% of the people, their first reaction is, well, I can buy a $150,000 sharing machine. I can buy a printer. I can send it to Germany to make it a surgical guy. I wonder if NASA can do a, you know, can get in on this. And only one out of 20 people just sit there and think, that grandma don't have any money. She wants to do it now. How can we do this faster, easier, cheaper? It's now. Yeah. Yep. You gotta be spontaneous. But like you gotta Warren, be able but, to do it. But when Warren Buffett is 90 years old and he's the richest investor who made his money purely from investing, when he says in his 90 years of what, I mean, we're just talking monkeys with clothes on. And he says that talking monkeys, 95% try to overcomplicate everything. Only 5% of people are naturally hardwired to just say, can we take out a step? And I look at Dennis. I mean, if you ever gone to a study club, the first guy will say, I just want you guys to know I'm, I'm the best dentist at the table. I'll trim my own dyes. And then, you know, uh, the next guy has to outdo me. He's like, well, I quarry my own stone, and then I trim my own dyes. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, I have my own beehive. I grow my own rabbit, quarry my own stone, trim my own dyes. By the time, time we get to this guy, it takes him 40 days to do the For 17 bucks. And what's their best idea? Well, you could get a 3M scanner for $17,000. I mean, I'll save money, right? I mean, this is 17, this is 17,000. That's what I should do, right? I mean, it's a lot bigger. It must be better. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's, it's like, I don't know if they smoke pot on the way to work. Colorado. Oh, Colorado. Colorado, it's edible. Uh, <laughs> me it, but, but I mean, so the bottom line is, I mean, even I'm not making fun of Dennis because Warren says it's that way for the CEOs of the S and P 500. He said it just blows his mind. And then, and then what he says about mergers and acquisition. So two losers get married, and now they're going to be a winner. He said every company that wants to merge with another company, they both say, "Well, we're messing up big time. I wonder if anybody will marry me." Well, if you're a drunk alcoholic, who do you think's going to marry you? Another drunk alcoholic. He said every time two sick company, anytime some company, if you really know what you're doing, you're growing and standing. If you have no idea what you're doing, you always want to merge with someone else. And uh, so it's just human nature to add complexity is all I was trying to say. That was a long way. It is. It's like like starting out. I, I used Are guides you know? for simplicity because I didn't have the training to know what to do. So I used that as a crutch. I didn't have... All of the skill set. You to gotta do know it. how I to thought, do it. If the guy I thought the technology work. would overcome my lack of training, so that's that's what set me to guides early on. I mean, I'm probably not the biggest guy user you will meet today. Uh, I can't remember the last time I actually used a guide. There are cases that the guide fits the case for, but at the end, but at the end of the day, like we all live in that world you're talking about, where. The patient may even have walked in our door looking, they finally got the courage up to finally walk in our door today. And I'm gonna tell them that like, the other day I'm in, I'm in Long Island lecturing and uh, I was talking about, I was talking about the, the same concept. It was like, you know, somebody walks in, I did a little study in my own practice that said, you know, if I waited, if I had, 
If I did the surgery in less than a week, I only had less than 2% of the people would back out or change. If I went from seven days to 14 days, it ran up to 8%. But by the time I, I took, if I made my patient wait 30 days before the surgery, 27% of them, nearly a third, found something else to do with their money or, or changed their mind because of the deal. So I asked this, I asked this, this group and this guy said, he goes, well, Dr. Brady goes, I don't know about your practice because mine's so busy I couldn't get him in for 30 minutes, 30 days. And I said, well, do you, I said, well, are you going to do any fillings this week? And he's like, yeah, I do like lots of fillings. And I was like, well, could you maybe do your filling on top of another filling over here, like double book and open up that slot for a procedure that instead of doing the procedure for $200, you're going to slide in a $2,000 procedure. I said, you have time. You're just not willing to manage your time appropriately. He got a little pissy, but at the end of the day, he understood what I was saying. Like the, the time is now with anything. And being you know, and if you do it that way, it's simple. Just do what you know. Yeah, and, and the convenience, it's not only getting implants, it, it's everything, it's, it's fast food. Um, it's the, the love, yeah, how many people just say, yeah, you know, we were meant to be, I met the love of my life, yeah, where'd you guys meet? We both went to the same high school in Parsons, Kansas, yeah, yeah, that was really meant to be. I <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, what were the odds of that? That's it. And you found the love of your life in the same shithole town. I mean, my God, that was meant to be. But they even say on the uh, on the uh, on the, the dating sites, um, the number one variable um, is still geography. I mean, you're not going to drive from Phoenix to LA for any reason. You uh, fast food. That's what the Irish meant at McDonald's. The, the Irish. Before the Irish, every place in America took one hour to get you a hamburger, fry, and a Coke. You went in, they seat you, they take your drinks, they come back, they take your order, they made the burger in the back, got your food in 50 minutes, you ate it, you know. And McDonald's said, we'll do it in three. And the bottom line is, I named my dental office, I named it Today's Dental. And I've been telling people for 30 years now, you remember, if, if, if you thought you had an emergency, would you make an appointment at the, at the hospital? Or would you just drive to the emergency room? This is today's dental. We have an emergency room. We got a room no one's ever scheduled. I told him for there, I said, if you're having an emergency, don't try to get through to Valerie. Get in your damn car and just come down. And it, it, it's and, and those are the cash because you're all busy doing these little cleanings, the little fillings, and a buckle pit on 19. But what's an emergency? Damn. Root canal, okay. bill and crown, 2,500. Yeah. Extraction, bone graft, implant, I mean, the emergency. I mean, the hospitals. I mean, every when I was at MBA school, there's about 10 people from the hospitals there. And I said, you know, the way Medicare and Medicaid works, they pay us so little money in all the exams and vaccines and everything. The only way we pay our bills, then they turn around and give us $100,000 for a bypass. And if we don't do three big surgeries a day, like three bypasses a day for hundred grand, it's that 300000 from three surgeries that covers all this noise we do. <laughs> so, so um, I, I'm going to go back. Um, I, I'm going to go back to something else that they say, and this is the weirdest thing that I always hear from dental students, and I, I, it blows my mind. They say, "Well, you know what? I don't like blood." It's like, shouldn't you have been like an engineer? I mean, how do you go to doctor school and then find out you what you didn't know? humans were filled with blood and guts I mean really you thought you thought I was an iPhone and um, so what do you say to a person that says I don't know I think I, I want to go into bleaching and bonding and veneers and sleep apnea because I just like white little fluffy stuff I don't really want to do like blood and guts and pull a tooth and lay a flap and do a root canal and where is there more money Root canals, extractions, and implants, or bleaching, bonding, and veneers? Blood. Blood. They're humans, dude. They bleed. I mean, uh, what, would you, what, would, what would you say to someone who said, I just wanted the little tooth fairy on a unicorn stuff? I just want fluffy dentistry. Probably find a new profession. Yeah. If you want to be successful, you're going to have to do everything. You know? You're not going to make um, a good living. Um, bonding and bleaching teeth and that's another that's another thing I, I i have a big beef with dentistry i mean i, I don't want to be judgmental about it but 
you hear all these marketing people talking about marketing to target certain patients to get bleach in your veneers. I mean, could you imagine going to the emergency room with a broken leg and they go, we don't do legs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, just, we just do arms. Uh, you need to be referred to a leg guy. I mean, I'm today's dental, and I figured when I plopped down here in 85044 30 years ago, I, I'm like the fireman. The fireman doesn't say, well, we don't, we don't do three bedroom, two bath houses. Sorry. Burn. We only do trailers or nine car garages. We don't do. I mean, I mean, it's a, I, I'm your That's dentist. A great point. That's why I um, worked my ass off in 87, 88, 90 to get fluoride in the water. That was a part of the, my deal of bringing down the DMFT. That's why we went into all the third grade classes every year. And there's two high schools, four middle schools, and eight elementary schools teaching the behavioral change. I mean, I'm a fireman. We show up to any fire. When you come through the door, I don't sit there and say, we don't do that. I mean, I'm, I'm your dentist. Um, so you're going to pull a tooth. And if you're in rural, I know those rural, those rural farmers. You tell them to drive two hours into the city. Grandpa says, hell no. Do it myself. Do it, yeah. 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 So we're at hour 15. We're gone way over, way over. I want you to all go around the table and do your uh, final deal as if you were. We just had 6,000 colleagues join our sovereign profession from 56 dental schools this very week. Um, if you had, if you were talking to the uh, graduation class, what, what would your commencement speech go like? What would your advice be? Yeah, seek out continuing education. Yeah, I have a, I had a mentor that sent me to continuing education. Mike and Moody teamed up for it. Yeah, that five thousand dollar course seems expensive, but like you're saying, your return on investment. I mean, it it comes back ten times over every year. So every month almost. Yeah, keep learning. Yeah, go for it. Justin, how would your commencement speech would go? Get out and do some stuff. But get out, get out, get out and work. You know, pull some teeth, do some fillings. Uh, you know, I like your example. You know, be the emergency room because uh, if you if you come out of school and you think that you're going to build your practice catering to the top five percent of the people, like it ain't it ain't gonna work, buddy. Like 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 get out and 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 serve the people because you know what that low the the lower end people that you're that you're trying to avoid are the ones that are gonna pay your damn bills. Because and they, they're humans. They need a doctor. They're humans. They need a doctor. And if you can't make money on selling a hamburger, fry, and coke in the poorest part of town at McDonald's, you're not a businessman. Just go to work. Yeah. Go to work and get some experience. Get some experience. You know, first know what you don't know. Like, don't get out in front of your skis and do something and get burned and, and then, no, I'll never do it again. You know, know what you don't know and then figure out a way to learn it. Mentor, buddy, online, CE course. Um, there's plenty of stuff out there to learn what you don't know. So I agree with him, but also just step out. You have to. You know, you get out of school and it's okay, it's normal to be scared because you haven't done it before. And now you're in the real world. But you've got to kind of step out of your comfort zone and just, just do it. That's, that's what we all did. That's what I did. Just do it. Yep. Leaders are readers. I mean, read, get your, get your head in some books. Uh, and then... And, Treat everybody like they're your family. I mean, you treat your family different. I mean, there's a different responsibility there, and and uh, you know, uh, that's a person that's that's counting on you. you. You got the title doctor. You should own that title. So being a doctor means you're going to take care of them in every fashion that you can. And, and, and I love your analogy. You know, I don't go to the hospital say we don't do legs. So um, this is what we do. I mean, own it like a doctor. I mean, I talk to too many guys that that shuffle it this way, they shuffle it that way. I mean, own it. That's what we do. Yeah, and what I'd say, a lot of you guys say that, you know, you're all scared because you got 350, 400, 500 thousand dollars student loan shit. If I graduated, I had 500 thousand dollars of student loans today. I'd say screw America. I moved to Lagos, Nigeria. I mean, look at these girls from Lagos. You want to find like, you want to find like a beautiful Nigerian princess or something, yeah. and uh, what, how much student loan debt do you say? Screw it, I'm going to Nigeria. <laughs> I'd somewhere four or five hundred thousand. Yeah. yeah, if you're if you're half a million dollars in debt, dude, I I tell it to Lagos, and uh, you know, you'd never look back. You never say. I, I really miss Oklahoma. I'm kill. Uh, yes, but uh, that's what I would do. But hey, I want to tell you guys seriously. Um, you know, my 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 key to watching. You know, I've watched kids come out for thirty years. 
And it's the ones that, num number one, they hustle. They have a work ethic. Yeah. I mean, some people just work twice as hard as other people. And, and I don't know if they're born with that. I don't know where that comes from. But you hustle. Um, the other one is humble. Um, the ones that come out and listen to mentors, they listen to their staff, they listen to the patients. I mean, you know, they say you have two ears and one mouth for a reason. You should listen twice as much. But the humble ones. And then there's another thing. I don't know if you're born with it or not, but... Some people are just intellectually curious, and those are the ones that took 100 hours of CE a year, their whole journey. And other people, they say, well, in dental school, we did this, and they were just never curious. But I think that's why I'm a big fan of yours and your podcast. That's why I'm a big deal podcast, because they're in, they're in small towns, and they only have a study club one night a month. And it's usually some local guy or some guy from State Farm or whatever, and now... With podcasting, you're getting, I mean, your podcast is amazing. You're getting these amazing guests, and they're all commuting to work. So that 100 hours a year in my generation, so they can do, they can do 250 hours a year just listening to a podcast. And on Dental Town, I only started this, you know, I did my first post in 98. Now there's a quarter million dentists posted five million times. I did an online CE course in 2004. Now we got 411 courses up there, and we're trying to get one of yours up there. Right. I think that'd we're be working. I think that'd be a great deal. And then we then we did our first blog, but I did the first podcast on Dental Town just to start the genre, and now we have 39 people podcasting. And usually they find the podcast first here, and then if they watch it a lot. They go to iTunes and subscribe to it or whatever, but. They, they, those kids tell me that they, they, they love the podcast. They all got an hour canoe. They say, you know, and, and what I try to do in my podcast is mine was, um, I try to do mine like a bookstore. So I did like, I interviewed like everyone who wrote an Indo textbook. And then I did every, you know, I, I did like 25 Indo dots and 25 worth of knots and 25. And what, what the love I'm getting is, is uh, I come out of school, I'm getting my ass kicked by Indo. And I, I, I've never heard of anyone that walk, listened to all the podcast. I mean, shit, I got 800. But they'll sit there and say, I, I watched like 20, or I watched like 15. The cutest email I ever got was this young girl from dental school. <laughs> and she said she just was getting beat up by Molarendo. And she listened to the podcast with that endodontist in Toronto, Ken Sirota. And she goes, she goes, I almost cried. I listened to the whole thing. I, I didn't even know what he said. She goes, I had to listen to that 10 times taking notes, whatever, and then when I finally realized everything Ken Sirota talked about, she goes, my endodontic skill was three times better. So stay curious, stay humble, hustle, stay curious. I mean, I mean, imagine when we were in school if you could have listened to an endodontist in Toronto for free on your iPhone. I mean, I got out of school. I mean, I'm, I'm so old that in radiology, the invention of my generation was the guy who figured out on the pano to put an R on one side and an L on the other. <laughs> we were like, shit, dude, that is really, really cool. Uh, I still think the greatest technology I ever lived through was the automatic garage door opener because uh, um, every time we pulled up the driveway, mom said, get out, you know, and uh, you'd be lifting that thing up, you know, and breaking your back. but. They they should be able to learn. Uh, you know how many dentists I've learned that that that, um, that said they they learned uh, bone grafting on YouTube. They just said I come home from work, I go to YouTube, I I I Google Fair bone up. grafting. You know, so stay humble, stay curious, and talk about hustle. Three day course finally over, and you get here at seven thirty, and you guys talk. For an hour and 20 minutes. That's freaking hustling, dude. Thank you guys so much for coming over. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks, man. Thank you.